Hello, I'm retired Battalion Chief Larry Cockman from the Greensboro, North Carolina Fire Department History Book Committee. We're here today at the Greensboro Historical Museum. I'm standing in front of the General Green, the first steam pumper, or as they called it back then, a steamer. Today, December 9th, 2019, we are starting a new tradition of recording and preserving the heritage and culture of our retirees. Our retirees have contributed so much to the success of our great fire department. Their stories retire with them and are sometimes gone forever when they pass away. They will share their emergency calls that will always be a part of their memories forever. So sit back and listen as they carry us through their journey in the Greensboro Fire Department. My name is Bobby Lee Wooten. Uh, I was in the Navy for four years, and when I got out, I was looking for a job, so uh, the only thing that was available was P. Lorillard, so I worked out there for two years. And uh, they was building a station on uh, Elm Street, Station 11, and my brother-in-law lived out there, and he said, they're building a station, you might get on the fire department. I said, hmm. So I go up and talk to them, and they said, yeah, we're looking for some people, and I talked to uh, Chief Houchet, he was the assistant chief, Moon Wack was the chief. And I come back a few times and they ask me more questions and check me off on the list, I guess. So I, I came to work. Well, for one thing, I was breathing a lot of dust where I was working. <laughs> and uh, I didn't like that too good. So I was really looking for a career. And I, after I thought it over, I, said, I would love to do that. And I did. And I, I loved it the whole time I was here. Um, only thing I know for sure is fill out an application, and then every time you come in and talk to mostly maybe Faye or one of the chiefs, they'd pull out that application and they'd make a mark on it that you come in and talk to them. And uh, I come in several times because I was interested in, and I wanted the job. And it paid about the same as I was making at Pete Lorillard. But uh, some of the people in my class had already been hired mm -hmm. and they was working at stations, but they came to work. Bill Long was one of those that uh, was working when he came. And I'm not sure about uh, Larry. I don't know if he was working, Larry, uh, Raymond Cotman, yeah. your brother. And uh, Fuquay, Graham Fuquay, okay. Porter Carruthers, right. uh, Alton you... Smith. Well, I, I really liked uh, Jay Lewis. He was in the class too. And uh, he liked everybody, and uh, everybody liked him. So. Yeah, we was, uh, they was big, putting in the pit out there where you suck the water out of for drafting. And uh, our training officer, R.L. Powell, was down in the pit with somebody. While he was in there, we decided to have a water battle. So we was wetting the ones on the ground. We was up in the tower, and he come out and caught us. So he said, okay, everybody up the top. Turn the hoses on them. <laughs> they soaked us. They, so we didn't do that anymore. But uh, <laughs> Chief uh, R.L. Powell was a real uh, safety guy. He didn't want us to do anything to get hurt. Nobody got hurt. However, some of the guys, like Porter Carruthers had been in the paratroopers, he slid the rope upside down. We, we, was on, we went to the, uh, on break, we went on break down to get a drink or something. Come back and he's coming out the window, from the top floor, head first, and uh, stuff like that. Yeah, every every day, a uh, few of the guys like Graham Fuquay and Raymond Cotman would be arguing about Chevrolets and Fords, and we'd also line up and play a little football. And Raymond could throw a ball at least, man, I don't know how far he. I thought, my goodness, the guy was running hard as he could run. He threw it right to him, three or four times. It wasn't just an accident. He, he was a good uh, football player and a quarterback. I did. And also, one of the things that impressed me the most was every one of the firefighters that I knew was just great people. They was good people. And uh, I, I didn't know anybody that I didn't like. Uh, no, I, I didn't. I never met anybody, really, that I, I liked some better than others and some, I, you know, that I did the others. But 
uh, I was really impressed with the fire department. And I told my wife, I said, it's the nicest bunch of guys I've ever run into. Because I hadn't been, I'd been at Pete Lord and I'd been in the Navy, and I'd been in high school and that kind of stuff, but they was really, they hired good people. I was working out to Station 9, and we had a ladder truck, so there was two captains in the room. One of them sleeping, and one of them wasn't. And he, Roy Marks could start snoring within one second of hitting the cup. And I've tried everything. I tried earplugs, listened to the radio. Finally, I took my mattress and went in the TV room and threw it on the floor and slept in there. But, uh, yeah, he could keep you awake. And uh, eventually, uh, they transferred him somewhere else, and I was... I had a temporary station assignment because they was building station 11 wasn't quite ready. So they brought a bunch of us to Central Station and I went on engine two with Ed Fullington. And I was there till they finished station 11, then they had a big transfer list came out. And I went to station three on Vine Street. It's now Yanceville Road, but it was Vine Street at the time. And uh, they really threw me in the briar patch because that's where I was born and raised. <laughs> I, I knew about every, I knew every, where every street went in there. I didn't know the names of all of them. But I'd been up and down all of those streets and lived in that area and out in Bessemer where we answered to and Edgeville and all those places. I, I knew where they were and I knew most of the streets. Within a month, I knew every street in the territory. So some uh, unfortunate things came up. Some they needed some drivers, and I'd been on two years, and they said, you got the job. I really wasn't, I said, I really didn't want to be a driver because uh, I just wanted to ride the back. But they asked me to do that, and I, I started driving when I was on about two years, and I drove for 10 years and took the captain's test a couple of times. First time they did away with the test, and the next time uh, I really got into it and studying, and uh, I uh, passed that test. Vic Stockard was the driver, and he'd been driving a long time, and he got killed in a, uh, an accident on his farm later. And he really helped me a lot, and Fred Lawrence was on, the, on that same company, and Fred said, you can use anything I got if you forgot something except my toothbrush, he don't get my toothbrush. <laughs> but that, that's the kind of guys they were, and, and they helped me all, tell me how to do it, and uh, made fun of me occasionally when I, tried to back that big deuce in, and the door was only about six inches on each side. I backed up about five times and come over and open the door and said, are you trying to get in sideways or this way? <laughs> uh, well, if you worked around Fuquay, you had a, always had a nickname. But I had a little ball spot, which I still have, and he, he called me Rabbi. And, because uh, <laughs> I had a place for a skull cap on top of the yarmulke. Well, I worked with J.W. Manus, and uh, he was one of the smartest guys I ever worked with. I learned a lot from him. He was a captain, I was a driver, and I had a little Volkswagen bug, and if he wanted anything, he's usually just go over to the store and get this, go get that. So one day we were working, and he, they'd been out the day before with a friend of his, Mr. Warwick, and uh, he was about 80 years old, which I thought was an old guy, but now <laughs> though, not too old. <laughs> But he sent me over to pick up Mr. Wagner. I said, well, where does he live? And he said, over on the other side of the ballpark. I said, there's a whole row of houses, mill houses. Isn't there? I said, there's a whole row of houses over there. Which ones he live in? He said, got long steps going up the front. Just go on there and you'll see him. I said, I'm not going unless you tell me an eighth go on and get him. He'll be looking for you. So I go over and uh, there's a guy out in the yard, but he's not looking at me. And I roll the window down and I said, uh, Mana sent me to get you to eat fish with us. He said, if it don't rain, I'm going fishing tomorrow. I said, he didn't know what I'm talking about. I, said, I opened the door and I said, Manus wants you to come eat fish with us. He got in the car and I took him back to the station. And when I come in, uh, Manus was in the kitchen, which is sort of where we come in, uh, in the building. And uh, he walked right by Mr. Wack and didn't say a word and come, caught me by the shirt and said, who is that guy? <laughs> he, he knew who it was, but I didn't, and he knew that. And he'd done people like that forever.
there's one more that really stands out, and I tell a lot of people, but we had a nice fellow that lived out in the back. He was Mr. Smith, retired from the mill. And we played pranks on him every day. He'd come out there every day, maybe two or three times a day. And uh, he liked to come out there and talk to us. So besides electrifying his chair once or twice, he, we'd freeze his hat. And because uh, he wore an old felt hat and he'd be out there mowing the yard and he'd come over and he'd be all sweaty and we'd put his hat in the freezer. When he got ready to go, it'd be frozen out of the rock. But uh, what I was going to tell you the most, the Manus liked to train dogs at the fire station. And he'd, he'd get a dog, it wouldn't be nothing special, just a dog, not, not a breed. But he, he had some real pretty dogs and he had a, a dog that he was training and we threw him something from the table and he caught it in his mouth and got to eat it. Well, when we got through eating every day, Mr. Smith had come out and we'd fix him a big platter of food that we had left. And uh, he, he was sort of weak on his stomach if you said anything about anything about food not being clean. He, 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 he couldn't take it. So the dog had been sitting over there for about an hour while we was eating and we was throwing him stuff off the table and he was catching it. So he's staring at us. So when Mr. Smith comes in, he's sitting there by himself, and the dog just beat in on him like I'm staring straight at you. <laughs> and uh, he asked Manus, he said, though, why is this dog staring at me? He said, you eating out of his plate. <laughs> <laughs> and he was ready for the bathroom. Oh, man. Uh, there was a union, and I took part in the first of it. We couldn't, uh, it really wasn't very powerful because our chief wouldn't listen to us and city hall wouldn't listen to us. And uh, we couldn't get any foothold in anywhere. But Joe Berry from Berry Oil Company stood up for us and he went and talked to city hall and then they talked to us. And it was no problem. We worked out everything. A lot of people, you know, signed resignations. They were going to quit. And uh, they could have turned them all in. I signed one, and man, there's a bunch of people signed up. And, but Joe Barry stood up for us, and uh, I really appreciated that to this day, and I've told him a lot of times. He's passed away now, but his grandson's running the business, and I talked to him just a couple weeks ago. Well, you live with four guys, mostly, three or four, but it's four assigned, and... Uh, you get to know them real well. They just like family. And we, when I first went to work, it was just firefighting. We didn't do any medicals, hardly any medical calls at all. And we chipped in a dollar a day to eat, and we had good meals off of that. Back then, that was a dollar was a dollar, but now uh, that's buy a popsicle with that. But we chipped in a dollar a day, and, every, and they'd figure out some meals for lunch and for night. And we, we had plenty. And we ate together all the time, and uh, we really wasn't allowed to take the truck anywhere to get food like they do now, but uh, that, that's changed during the, during the time. But, uh, I learned to cook there. And basically what we would do is uh, I would cook about two or three things, and everybody would cook two or three things, and you sort of alternated those two or three things that you cooked. Like if I was good at spaghetti and making cornbread, they'd let me do that. And then uh, if somebody else, we had, a, we had a cook, a couple of times cooked every meal, and he was really good at it. Uh, but they had a rule at Central Station, we had about 20 guys eating, and they had a rule saying if you complained about the food, you had to wash dishes by yourself. So that cut down on the complaint, and one guy said, this is the worst beans I've ever tasted. <laughs> oh, but it's the way I like them. I like them <laughs> like this. <laughs> uh, we rode uh, Engine 2 from Central Station out behind the Summit Shopping Center. We had a kitchen, small kitchen fire, put it out right quick. And then the most terrifying thing when we got through was Vic Stockard was acting captain. He told me to drive back. <laughs> I never drove a truck. And uh, so I learned how to drive starting that day. Okay, the first call I ever drove was I had been made driver already. And I really didn't even know how to start the truck because we had a guy I worked with was sort of, he was sort of, I'm the second driver and you ain't driving this truck. 
So I never got to drive me, not, not even drive it back. Wow. And when I got in the first call, I'm a starter at, <laughs> with the keys. No <laughs> keys, they had to start it. But anyway, I got there and uh, I was a little bit, uh, you know, excited. And we had a house rolling. And it was way out on the, off of Church Street. It was like a house lined with cardboard and that thing ran off like and we laid a line in. Captain Grogan was my captain, and uh, we got it put out, but it was exciting for me. So we, we just answered fire calls for several years, and I, worked, I was working in the meal section where we mostly fought fires with cone meals. And they'd, they'd get started putting it out, and then if they got away from them, they'd call us. And uh, sometimes we'd have a little excitement because... Under the mill where the fires were was some holes down there where the water drained into. And we knew where the holes were, but some of the chiefs didn't. And so we was under Revolution Mill and uh, Chief Sprinkle, which was a super nice guy, stepped off in one of them holes up to his neck. And uh, the water was about, on us, was about, you know, knee deep. But that hole was really deep and we forgot to tell him. One of the biggest fires I was on was Guilford College. And it was a dormitory and it was in the attic. Somebody had poured some accelerant out and lit it and it was rolling. We looked up in a, a small opening and you could see, it looked like a furnace roll, the fire was rolling around. But when I first got there, we caught a, hy we caught a hydrant and went in. Some of their hydrants didn't have water, didn't have about two pounds pressure. And some of the really old lines, and we didn't use those, so we laid one from the street. And someone uh, in maintenance out there showed me how to get to the attic because it was a long haul, and one door went to the attic, but the rest of them went into the rooms. He showed me, and I, I, to this day, I don't know who he was, but we opened the door and went up, and uh, I had Hal O'Neill and uh, Raymond Holloman. And the driver, of course, stayed outside. That was uh, Wayne Sandridge. And uh, we dropped off uh, Hal O'Neill, which is sort of a new guy, a rookie maybe, at the hydrant. But by the time we got to the, with the hose, he was already in there with me. And the three of us took the line up. We just took a small inch and a half line up the side of the building in a window and put it right on the fire. And we almost put it out. We did put it out, but uh, they had big beams in there, like six by sixes. It was an old, old building, and uh, they used heavy timbers. And it never, those timbers burned and scorched them, but the fire went out. We had the, the, our own in truck three answering with us, and uh, I can't remember who was on there, right? I, anyway. I asked them to see if they could ventilate the attic, and they did. And we pushed that fire right out of there, and hardly any water damage, hardly any fire damage. They cleaned it up, kept the building going. And uh, to, after that, I, I did get uh, two letters of accommodation from the chief, and one from Chief Kent and one from Chief Honeycutt. But I felt bad about it because those two young guys I had one put the fire out. Well, as a captain, I, I really liked J.W. Manus because he was really smart and he you could pull nothing past him. He, he knew what to do and everything. And Chief Honeycutt was a really uh, a good friend of mine. And like that. Well, I, they started, our company started building inspections. We had never done that before and they just chose our shift, our company, one shift to start it. And I thought, man, I hate building inspections, but I had some guys that worked with me, Fuquay and Jimmy Williams. Really smart guy, he did all the paperwork. I, he did everything for me, and we, we, we did a good job on it. And I was surprised because I didn't think, especially me, you know, building inspection. But we, working with Jimmy and Fuquay and they, they was really uh, helpful. We had a fire in O. Henry Oaks while I was working at Station 3 as a driver, and it was my sister's house, and her son got burned to death. And uh, it, it, it bothers me to this day. He, he lived for about a week after that, and uh, he was uh, 
they, those houses, they were just living there while they were building their house. And those houses had hot water heaters in the uh, utility room with gas, heated with gas. And they had the lawnmower stored in there. And this little fellow was, he, he was into something all the time, but he decided to fill up the tank. And the gas can was sitting there. He filled it up and it ran over in the floor up under the hot water heater. And it, it just, him and his little brother both was in there. And uh, it, it was terrifying for me. I was, uh, I was really uh, proud and thankful when I made captain because I had no idea I was going to. I just, I studied hard. I studied mostly for fireman two. And studying for fireman two, all the questions on the captain's test was in that, mostly, you know. So uh, J.W. Maynus gave me a little book to read on how to do an interview. And I read that in about an hour or two. It wasn't a really big book. But uh, after I read that and went on the interview, all the questions they asked me wasn't worded the same, but they was the same question. And uh, I, mm. so it was like a uh, guy was complaining about his job. He hated it, and I hate this place. And so you need to, you know, find out what's wrong. So the problem was his uh, sister was going blind, and he was worried about her. And he wasn't making enough money. So they asked me that same question. It was, and I mean, they didn't, it wasn't somebody going blind, but uh, same, principle. same principle. And uh, I read it out of the book, and it was, right, it was the right answer. You, uh, you get nervous for about maybe two days, and you can feel your chest you know, tight. And I don't know what it was. We, we didn't have anybody to talk to us or tell us anything, but... Uh, we had some calls that nobody got killed, but I still got excited. We had a fire one time out on Cone Boulevard where a gas lane, a gas pumping station caught on fire. It was really roaring like a jet engine. And we was first in, and uh, we, we couldn't put it out. That thing was shooting up in the air for like 80 feet, but we thought maybe it might explode. At any minute, we were sitting only about 15 feet away. One of the firemen, uh, a, a new guy, actually ran, and uh, they eventually fired him for that. But we were scared, and my and my chest hurt me for about two days after that, because I was I was really, you know, I was the driver, and I could stay behind the truck mostly. But uh, we had uh, Captain Summers was the captain, and. He was, he was, he wasn't afraid. He went right on up there, but he was going to try to put it, it was burning like a jet engine sticking straight up in the air. And it was making a terrible noise. Every chief on the fire department came out there to see. And uh, most of the ladder trucks from Central Station parked all the way down at Summit Avenue. They, they didn't want to come up there. I don't blame them. But uh, that, that was, that bothered me for about two or three days. But we had some deaths in the, mostly smoke inhalation. But like I told you before, the, uh, most of my firefighting was in cone mills, <laughs> in them or under them. And uh, we, had, we had one guy that I remember that he burned to death in his kitchen. And all he had to do was just open the door and he'd been out, but he laid down in the kitchen floor. Oh. And, uh, and he was somebody I knew. Also. I was working the night Jesse Gray got backed over, and it really, really upset me for a long time. And uh, knowing how Fred Lawrence was a driver, it really, I mean, I don't know how he ever got over it. I don't think he did, but, but it wasn't his fault. I mean, it, it just wasn't his fault. They told him to back up, and he did. No, I was at the station, but I was listening to it on the radio. As best I can remember, uh, they stopped. Uh, somebody had set a house on fire intentionally. It was an old, empty house. So engine two pulled up near where they was going at the hydrant. And then, they, of course, the captain is talking on the phone, on the radio, and he said they got some more instructions. Come on down to another street, and there's a hydrant there. So Jesse thought they was catching a hydrant, so he pulled the hose off and was preparing to uh, catch a hydrant when they backed up and he was just in the hose and they backed over him. And uh, we, we, we could hear, I mean, the, 
I think uh, Captain Brown was was the captain. Was that He's, Paul Brown? Paul Brown. He was a real easygoing guy, and, mm -hmm. and it upset him and the driver. You could tell they was all just all to pieces, and we were too. No, I, well, like I, I drove for 11 years, and uh, I never hit anything or had an accident, <laughs> but you always thought about it. But uh, the only thing I ever did was sort of stupid was I was on a call, and uh, I was trying to catch up with my crew, and I jumped over this little wall, and I went down about six feet and landed on my knees because it was a place they backed under the mill, backed under the building. That was over there at, uh, across from Station 6. I forgot what it was, a pretty, pretty bad fire, but anyway, I, young enough that I could take the blow. <laughs> Tore my pants and quick hit pants. So, I enjoyed it. I met a lot of people that was really nice guys, and, and I still see them today, a lot of them. And, uh, and it was just, I, I enjoyed it, yeah. Yeah, some of the big changes was we was working every other day and uh, 24 on, 24 off. Of course, you, most everybody had a part-time job so they could keep, uh, keep their bills paid. We didn't make very much money. And uh, I got a job eventually with Sears and uh, I worked for them for 30 years. But during that time I was working one day and I hear over there, I'd wake up at the fire station and I'd say, where am I at? I'm, oh, I'm at the fire station. I'm going to Sears. If I woke up at home, I knew I was going to the fire station. So it, it got it gets on you a little bit when you work that much. But and we was working like 96 hours a week, and they cut that back. Wow. My health was really good when I retired. I retired when I was remember 57. I had my 30 years in, so I retired, and uh, I, I enjoyed that, and I was really healthy. Since then, in 19, well, 2000, I had a heart attack and uh, did open heart surgery. And uh, that's about 19, 20 years ago. Um, I still feel pretty good, but I I'm, I'm, don't have much energy. One person that probably made a big difference in my life was uh, J.W. Maynus, because he, he really knew a lot about everything, read all the time and uh, helped you out with a lot of, when, when we did stuff to, play games to wash the dishes, we played games that you'd have to, they'd ask you questions on the fire department. Well, we'd, uh, after, after we ate, there'd be, sometimes there'd be more than four, but four or five people, and when we was at station uh, five, they had a lot more people, and maintenance would put questions on the board, and uh, you had to answer them. And ever who got the best score got off from washing dishes. Maybe the second one and the third one and the fourth. Fire related questions. Fire department questions. And we did it every day. <laughs> uh, one of the most important things in my life was uh, I joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints when I was at Station 3. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to live those uh, principles ever since. We hope you enjoyed watching these documentaries. It was our goal to share and preserve the memories of our retired Greensboro firefighters. It is our desire that these documentaries will inspire future generations to continue the brotherhood, sisterhood, and camaraderie while always striving for excellence in their careers. While fire apparatus, equipment, and technology have improved, several things will always remain the same. The courage and bravery it takes to mitigate natural and man-made disasters will always be a part of the job. Although our retirees are no longer a physical part of the GFD world, a giant piece of each retiree's memories have been shared with you today. These memories will be in their hearts and minds forever. A special thank you goes out to Captain Harold Haney for his many long hours of recording and editing. Thank you, Harold. 
a job well done. Mm -hmm.